ADAS, Advanced Driver Assist Systems. This technology has been around for a little while, but do we as an industry understand it? We have to be able to understand this technology to be able to advise our customers correctly. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sean Brooks, uh, and it's a great honor for me to stand here in front of you today, some of the top people in the industry. Please join me as we uncover ADAS. So I am lucky enough to be able to um, talk about ADAS all around our business. And one of the first questions I ask any group is what is ADAS? What is the definition of ADAS? Surely this is one key question that we need to understand. For me, ADAS is an array of sensors monitoring the environment around the vehicle. These sensors will give the driver safety information so that could just be a simple dash icon. It could be a haptic alert through the steering wheel or even the seat. More advanced systems will actually take control of the vehicle, correct its position within the lane, or even bring it safely to a halt in the event of an emergency. So I'd like you to think back to your very first car. My first car was a little orange Mini Clubman. And like most 17 year old guys, I had to have the wide Weller wheels and the straight through exhaust. And that little mini Clubman had no way of understanding its surroundings. It was purely reliant on my driver input, purely reliant on me understanding the surroundings. So these sensors that understand and monitor the environment, they, they typically free. They can be made up of vision-based sensors, such as cameras. They can be distance sensors, known as radars and lidars. So sensors understanding vehicle surroundings is nothing new. We've had ultrasonics for a number of years. And ultrasonic sensors are pretty much mounted to the front and rear bumpers, monitoring the distance from an object about two to four meters of range. Now the natural progression of that is moving into radars. So radars are typically mounted to the front and rear bumpers, an example on the rear bumper could be used for systems such as blind spot detection. So this is using uh, a distance measurement sensor to monitor the area that's quite difficult for the driver to see on the right and on the left of the vehicle. Constantly keeping an eye in that area. The next range up is camera based systems. So has anybody heard of 360 surround vision? In simple terms, if you imagine your, your car being filmed from above, say a drone was flying above your car looking down, you'd be able to see all the way around. And these four cameras are typically mounted to the front and the rear of the car and underneath the wing mirrors. These four camera images are stitched together to make it look as if there's one image. Now imagine the uh, safety aspect of that. When you're trying to park, you've got a low wall, you've got a little post. Perhaps you're reversing on the drive and a little kiddie's left his bike. These are all objects that's difficult to see in our wing mirrors. With these cameras, you've got that extra view around the vehicle. And up front there, you'll see the windscreen mounted camera. Now the primary job of the windscreen mounted camera is to recognize objects, object recognition, or what I like to say, lines and signs, because it allows people to easily relate that that function is there to recognize objects. So it could be traffic signs, it could be lane markings in the road ahead. The distance could be about 100 meters away from the vehicle. So quite a considerable distance in front of the vehicle. The next range up from that, we have LIDAR. So LIDAR is a, di a distance detection sensor and that's typically also mounted to the windscreen. This sensor can read about 150 meters away from the vehicle. Now, generally speaking, it's a lot less than that. The longest range is the long range radar, and that's adaptive cruise control, typically. So this is another distance measurement sensor. And one thing you'll notice as the ranges increase, the field of vision begins to narrow. So a long range radar is quite a narrow, but a very long uh, field of vision.
Okay? So my first opening statement was ADAS monitors the environment around the vehicle. Just have a look at that environment around the vehicle. There's not a lot of environment that's not monitored in some way, shape, or form. And as a driver, can you monitor every single area of every single second of every single journey? Absolutely not. And this is the safety aspect of ADAS. It's constantly monitoring the environment, providing they're correctly calibrated or correctly aligned. If we just look at that long-range radar, just imagine if that wasn't aligned to the vehicle correctly. Would that be monitoring the environment in the correct space? Potentially not. So I've just got a short introduction video to whet your appetite. The automobile, cars. Technology constantly evolves them, yet they remain essentially the same. A form of transport, typically with four wheels, designed to carry a small number of people, one of whom operates the vehicle. One of whom operates the vehicle. Cars are arguably undergoing their most defining evolution, ever. Introducing ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, a set of features designed to provide the safest driver experience possible. These systems rely on a range of sensors to monitor the car's surroundings. But what do these sensors achieve? So, you're driving along the road and a child steps out unexpectedly. You're looking in the rear view mirror, so you didn't see her, but don't worry. Your pedestrian detection with auto brake did. And your traffic sign recognition system was keeping an eye on the speed limit for you too. So, you got the heads up when that dropped to 30. And as we move around to the back of the car, there it is. I've entered into the blind spot. If I were a car, the blind spot monitoring system would now let the driver know that I'm back here. As well as knowing I'm back here, ADAS can monitor the lanes in the road surface ahead. The lane keeping assistant can let you know if you're going to leave a lane, even keep you in one if it needs to. Adaptive cruise control can adjust your speed according to the conditions ahead. And the high beam assistant can switch on your high beams automatically. Even adjust your light for the oncoming traffic, the road layout and the surroundings. Those are just a few examples, there are plenty more. If you take the capabilities of ADES and combine them with a sturdy navigation system and global positioning, we are astonishingly close to an achievable self-driving car. Think of the industries these changes can affect. Does a driver still insure a car? Or does the manufacturer guarantee it? How will these changes affect us? Let's take a look at the technology behind these ADAS applications. ADAS uses radars to measure distances, LIDARs to detect the distance to the vehicles in front, and finally cameras like this one here. Mounted behind the windscreen, it is ideally located to view the surroundings. Everything from pedestrians, to lanes, to traffic signs. So what happens when the windscreen needs replacing? Well, most vehicle manufacturers require that the camera be calibrated. To store changes in angle and position. As failures to do so can affect ADAS functioning. So where do you go to get your camera calibrated? Us. We've partnered with experts to develop custom calibration equipment. Once the windscreen has been replaced, we can utilize our equipment to calibrate the ADAS camera following the manufacturer's instructions. We've invested significantly in developing equipment and training teams. And because of that, we're becoming industry leaders.
There may come a day where a car needs neither a driver nor a windscreen. But until that day, we're here to keep you safe. certainly gets me excited. Um, so I'd just like to look at some of the technology uh, my colleague spoke about in that video. The first technology I'd like to talk about is adaptive cruise control. So cruise control is nothing new. It was first fitted to Chrysler vehicles back in 1958, believe it or not. And in simple terms, the driver puts in 70 miles an hour, that car's going to do 70 miles an hour. It has to be reliant on the driver to turn it off. It's got no way of understanding what's in front of it. So using front-mounted radars, the long-range radar, that is sensing the environment. It's understanding that there's a vehicle in front, and it's beginning to back your car away. So it's controlling the distance from that vehicle in front. Now, radar stands for radio detection and ranging. So it's using radio waves to measure that distance. It's very rapid in its distance measurement. Typically, these sensors can monitor range two, three, four, five hundred meters, but anything up to 800 meters is possible. Just think about that for one moment. If you're on the M1 at night, it's raining, there's road spray everywhere, visibility is poor. That sensor's not going to be affected by those weather conditions. That sensor is looking 800 meters down the road and is able to spot the vehicle in front is stationary in the outside lane probably before we've even seen it. This is the safety aspect of ADAS. So there's our radar. Um, we're also beginning to see the integration of the windscreen mounted camera within that system, which I'll talk to you about a little bit further. Now these radar sensors are typically mounted to the front bumpers. And this for me is where awareness becomes critical. Because if we understand a little bit about what we're looking at here, we can correctly advise our customers. We can correctly advise a correct work method. We can correctly advise a correct key to key time. So typically, they're uh, underneath the badge, or they can also be loaded, uh, mounted in the lower grill area. Another radar based technology is blind spot. So this uses rear mounted radars. It's about a 20 meter range either side of the vehicle. I'm sure we've, been in the, we've all been in the scenario where perhaps we've been driving on a motorway, we've looked in our wing mirrors, there's nothing there, we've gone to indicate and change lane, and all of a sudden we've realized there's a car lurking in our blind spot. This technology is constantly monitoring that area that's difficult for us to see as a driver, and it gives us some type of safety icon, typically in the wing mirror. Now on your journey home, just have a look when you're driving on a motorway, how many vehicles have actually got that orange icon in the wing mirror? It's, you'll be surprised how many have actually got it fitted already. And that's all coming from the rear mounted radar. So moving to vision based systems, camera, windscreen mounted camera, do you remember I was saying object recognition, lines and signs, nice and easy to remember. Lane assist is one of the key technologies which windscreen mounted camera is running. So in simple terms, the camera is looking for road markings, it's looking for lane markings, and it's comparing its position in relation to those. One key question for this is, what are the road marking like? What are the road markings like in your area? They can be quite worn out. So this technology works great on main roads, on motorways, etc. But you get to some of the rural areas, it's going to struggle a little bit. So it's purely camera driven. Another technology is traffic sign recognition. Now, this in simple terms does what it says on the tin. It's looking for traffic signs and it repeats that information on the dash to the driver. And a lot of people say to me, well, my sat -nav's done that for years. And you'd be correct. But what's the difference between a sat -nav or a GPS-based system over a camera-based system? Well, the key difference is the camera is able to read the live environment. So think back to that scenario where you're on the M1 again, smart motorway, new speed restriction. If you're going southbound at 8 o'clock on the M1, the chances are that's a 40 mile an hour zone. If you've only got a sat-nav or a GPS-based system, you're gonna, your sat-nav is going to say 70 miles an hour. It's going to have no idea that there's a new speed zone of 40 miles an hour because of congestion. Okay. 
Now, this technology is constantly evolving. So mono cameras progressed into stereo cameras, and now the latest cat out of the bag is trifocal cameras. And trifocal cameras are absolutely amazing. Because trifocal cameras, in simple terms, is three cameras in one unit. And each one of these cameras is monitoring a different range ahead of the vehicle. And each one of those ranges has a different field of vision. Now, as the slide uh, says, range number one has about a 150 degree field of vision. And that might not sound a lot, but you looking at me here today, your typical field of vision is 120 degrees. So this camera has got the ability to monitor the area here and here if I'm looking straight ahead. It's keeping an eye on this area that I would have no idea of what's going on unless I turn my head. Obviously, this is a key part for us because we have to keep pace with this technology. Technology, the pace of change is immense. It's probably more so than ever before in the industry. And it's something that certainly really excites me. So you're probably wondering, why do we need all three of these sensors to run a modern ADAS equipped vehicle? The simplest way I've found to explain this is if I take my phone out and take a picture of you guys, I'd have quite a nice souvenir of the day. And I can look in that picture and I can say, well, there's people in that picture. But I'd have no way of knowing how far away those people are. So I'd need some other form of sensor to be able to measure that distance for me. And that's where manufacturers are using LiDAR with camera or LiDAR, uh, sorry, radar with camera. And this slide just helps illustrate it. So the black car going down there is our ADAS equipped vehicle monitoring the environment in front. The camera cutout is a black and white image in the middle. Now most of these cameras see in black and white. If you think about what they're being asked to do, they're asked to look for white lines on a black surface or black writing on a white sign. The radar cutout to the left, all those blue dots are all those objects and the distance number next to it. Now if you look at that green circle, if you work that back through the camera and actually what's going on in the environment, that's the pedestrian. That's the pedestrian that's just about to walk out in front of us. Now as drivers, we're more distracted now than ever. We've got smart watches, we've got smartphones, uh, we've got text messages being read through our car, we've got Costa Coffee on every street corner. Let's just say that this driver is distracted. He's not seen that pedestrian, but his ADAS systems have recognized it and potentially will react accordingly. So there's two different distance measurement sensors. I mentioned LiDAR and I mentioned radar. And this pretty much does split the manufacturers because there's pros and cons to both. Radar is cheaper than LiDAR but radar can see further. The biggest or the main difference is LiDAR will see in 3D. LiDAR has got the ability to scan an environment and understand its surroundings. It can perfectly understand the surface of a car. Where radar is just going to be able to see in 2D, it will say there's a box shaped object and it's 10 meters away. LiDAR can be affected by certain weather conditions, where generally speaking, radar doesn't get affected by weather conditions. Do you remember I was saying about we're beginning to see the integration of the windscreen mounted camera to that? It's not till you add that input is when that image begins to make sense, object recognition. So that's how the systems are beginning to be linked together. So whenever we integrate and work with these systems, generally speaking, there's a calibration required. We must follow the manufacturer's instruction for calibration. So what do these instructions say? This is just two examples. Not particularly new examples, not particularly prestige examples. Fairly run of the mill. So we've got nearly a three-year-old Audi A3 and a four-year-old C-Class Mercedes. The Audi one for me is really key. 
because the Audi one clearly says whenever you've taken the rear bumper off, that's generating the need for a calibration. So that's not saying after accident repair, that's saying you're just taking that bumper skin off, you're going to need to calibrate. And we see similar on the Mercedes after any accident repair in the front area. So it's quite clear about the need for calibration. So these sensors can be undercover. They can be quite fragile. And this is where awareness comes in, particularly with the MET guys, because the MET guys must be able to recognize what that sensor is. It's very easy to mistake that sensor as just a black box. Yes, we can diagnose these on our pre-scans and pick them up on the pre-diagnostic scan, but actually, if all of those fail safes, we must be able to recognize the need for calibration on that particular sensor. So, what are we actually doing when we calibrate? So this is our ADAS equipped vehicle, monitoring the environment, going down the road, it's clearly able to see that vehicle in the blind spot. Yeah, all the sensors are working, everything's monitoring the environment as intended. Let's just say that same vehicle has been in the front and rear impact, nothing too major, but for whatever reason, that vehicle has not been correctly calibrated. Those sensors have not been aligned to the vehicle. Have a look at the effects of perhaps a long range radar. Have a look at the effects of the medium range radar running a blind spot system. Are those sensors working? They are working. Are they monitoring the environment where they should be monitoring? Absolutely not. So that's okay, we should have a dash light to warn us that actually our sensors are not in a line. Chances are we haven't. So that's okay, we've got diagnostics tools. So we have a diagnostic trouble code, a DTC, to tell us that our sensors are out of alignment. Chances are we won't. The only way we're gonna know that those sensors are out of alignment or they're in correct alignment is by completing a calibration. So in that same scenario, that radar sensor is still working, but it's unable to see that car in its blind spot. So we've been involved with calibration for quite some time now. There's typically two different types of calibration. And some research completed by Belron last year suggests that 99.5% of all ADAS equipped vehicles require some form of calibration. Now it's the manufacturer that set the type of calibration. So there's either a dynamic term or a static. A dynamic is those manufacturers on the left. So these manufacturers in simple terms need a diagnostics tool to activate a function within the vehicle and you're pretty much going on a learn cycle to complete that calibration. Now, as part of that calibration, there'd be prerequisites about the length of time, the distance, the speed, and may even be quality road markings and signage. And just to be able to meet some of those prerequisites can be a bit of a challenge. Think about if we need to do 40 miles an hour in the central of London, that's going to be a challenge. If we need good quality road markings in rural Devon, that could be a challenge. So there's pros and cons to each type of calibration. I've just got a brief video to give you a little bit of a flavour of the dynamic. So the manufacturers on the right there, they're all the static manufacturers. So static calibration in simple terms requires a target board to be presented precisely in front of the vehicle. 
So each one of those manufacturers has its own target. And this presents a challenge for us. Because we're working on so many different vehicles, we have to have every single one of those targets available in every single one of our sites. So this target is presented in front of the vehicle. It has to be so precisely placed, we're aided by lasers. We also will only complete these calibrations in our controlled environment because lighting conditions are really important as well as a, a level floor is also key. Just got a brief video to give you a little bit of a flavor on static. Process. So what's our solution to all this? Uh, it was quite interesting uh, that Steve mentioned a level four vehicle earlier. This is where I start getting super excited because autonomy um, is a qu quite a passion of mine at the minute. So um, is anybody aware of the five levels of autonomy? Brilliant, okay. So if we think back to my little orange mini clubman, that's a level zero car. That's got no way of understanding its surroundings. So that's kind of where we've been. If we jump to the other end of that scale, we've got level five. Level five is full autonomy. Level five will have no driver controls. You'll have no steering wheel, no foot pedals. You'll have something representing a touch screen and you'll be able to tap in uh, National Motor, Mo Motor Cycle Museum, Coventry, jump in the back, put your hair and makeup on, catch up on some emails, watch a film, you'll arrive safely at your destination. If we take a step back from that, level four is where I'm particularly comfortable. Because level four, as Steve said earlier, will give you the ability to drive. So you'll have normal foot controls, you'll have a steering wheel, you'll have the option to be able to drive or pass it over to the vehicle to drive you home. Now I travel all over the country and I do a lot of miles as I'm sure you guys do. And I just like that option to be able to go, you know what, I just wanna catch up on some emails on the way home. But I also really, really enjoy driving. So I want that flexibility to be able to drive when I want to drive. Level one to three represents our journey to full autonomy. So the systems I've talked to you about this morning pretty much represent level one. So that will be your standard lane assist, your traffic sign recognition, and your adaptive cruise systems. Level two takes that a little step further, so it begins to have a little bit more control over the vehicle, a little tighter lane holding, um, a little bit more effective adaptive cruise. Level three 
begins to get quite exciting because that gives us uh, conditional automation. So the scenario for a level three vehicle might be, it will need to be on a motorway. It will need to be perhaps below 35 miles an hour. So if you're stuck in the M1, under 35 miles an hour, perhaps that vehicle will recognize that as uh, a level three option and it will pretty much do its thing. Now that presents a key challenge for manufacturers because if your car has been driving along quite happily at 35 miles an hour because you've been stuck in traffic, are you paying as much attention to the road ahead? When that car turns around and says, hey, we've reached the speed limit, or there's a situation in front that it, the car can't deal with, please take control. You've got a split second to understand what's going on in front of you. And it's for that reason a lot of manufacturers are looking at skipping from where we are today straight to level four. So what does that look like in the car park outside? Well, you'll be pleased to know it's not my little mini clubman. I've just chosen the Mark I Ford Fiesta. There's not too many of them around. And I did actually have a Mark I Ford Fiesta. And it was brown and it did have a gold go faster stripe. <laughs> um, so that's our basic car. No safety systems on that. Uh, on my little mini clubman, I had a strange handle shaped thing uh, on the door. And when I turned that, if I was really lucky, the window would go up and down. Uh, my emergency brakes basically involved me frantically stamping the foot brake, known as cadence braking. I had no safety systems at all. So a level one vehicle, this year's Ford Fiesta. This year's Ford Fiesta becomes as standard with a lot of these features. Pretty much as standard, out of the box, level one. Just look at the journey that vehicle's taken. All right, I know it's probably 40 years between the two marks, but that's what's driving this technology as standard fitments. So does level two exist? Anybody want a hazard of guess? Can I buy a level two car today? Steve's nodding his head, there's a few nods. Tesla. So that's what I'd class as a level two car. So for, for me, a level two car, you still need to be in the driver's seat. You're still not able to jump in the passenger seat and do your hair and makeup. You still need to be monitoring what that vehicle is doing. I use the analogy a lot, it's a bit like a naughty toddler. You have to keep an eye on it all of the time because the moment you don't, it's pulling your pots and pans out of your kitchen cupboard and getting into all sorts of mess. <coughs> Level three, bit of debate around this one. So a level three, or this year's Audi A8, will drive autonomously up to 38 miles an hour in an, uh, a known environment, such as a motorway. It's not released in this country at present, but the technology is there. The legislation in this country is not quite there to support that vehicle. Level four, who knows where level four goes. If I was a betting man, I'd probably be putting quite a bit of money uh, on the XC90. Anybody any views on that? No, okay. So what's our solution? It's not just a piece of glass. The modern windscreen is not just a structural piece of glass. Uh, it's, it's a structural piece of uh, the upper strength of the car, but it also provides a key mounting point to some of these sensors. So some of these cameras and lidars are mounted to the camera. Sorry, mounted to the windscreen, getting tongue-tied. We've had to keep pace with this technology. We've had to invest in the equipment to be able to complete the calibration and the work required. We've had to raise awareness within our teams not only for technicians, but also for the guys that answer the phone, the guys in our customer experience center. It's all right them having a script. They have to be able to understand what that script means if the customer is questioning it. And also standards and standardization. 
We have to be able to prove competence of our people. And we do that with the IMI, working closely with them. So we reckon by the end of this year, 20% of all our work will require some form of calibration. So we have to be ready. We consider ourselves to be true calibration experts. We completed 70,000 calibrations last year. Globally around the world, that was 404,000. That's a heck of a lot of calibrations. To be considered an expert, you have to have the experience. I strongly believe that we have the experience. We were a key part of uh, the Thatcham research of the code of practice. We also believe that we have 98% software coverage of the UK market. And we do that by continuing investing in our footprint and our diagnostics partners. So 98%, it's quite a bold statement, but it's not good enough. We want to be able to offer our customers 100%. So we do this by working di with diagnostics experts, diagnostics partners such as Bosch, to be able to bridge that gap. So if there was three key points I'd like you to take back to your businesses tomorrow, it's those three. Awareness is absolutely critical. Every area of your business, so people that speak to customers, to people that are working on the vehicles, to people that are doing the pre-scans, to people that are doing the post-scans and actually being able to complete the calibration. Calibration is absolutely vital. We must be able to have access to the methods and also be able to understand those methods. Work with trusted brand experts such as ourselves. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. <laughs>